is Your Life, a program for all America. And now here he is, Mr. This is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. This is Bob Warren bidding you welcome to This is Your Life. In another studio here at NBC Burbank, California, two famous comedy stars are rehearsing a television film trailer for their newest movie. We are secretly hooked up to their... Watch and guess which one of them Ralph Edwards is about to surprise. Take it away, Studio 4. I want to talk about Dance With Me, Henry. <laughs> yes, yes, I want to dance with me. No, 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 wait a minute. Well, what's all this talk about Dance With Me, Henry? Oh, no, what's on second? Who's on second? Oh, who's on first? What's on first? What's on second? I don't know. Oh, he's on third. You don't... Who, who's on third? Who's on... <laughs> Look, I'm looking forward to that uh, new Abbott and uh, Costello picture dance with me, Henry, but... Uh, Wait, hold right, on. What right night now, is tonight? I'd like what's, to break in on your night? rehearsal to say that tonight, great comedian and half of a beloved team of comedians, this is your life. Lou, <laughs> <laughs> oh, your good partner here. Oh, but we can relax. Bud Abbott told me this would be a uh, great chance to get you off guard, pal. We sure did, didn't we? Yes, you did. We did indeed. Lou, your life would make a great movie itself. Because often, unknown to all of us who watched your happy clowning on stage or the screen, you were hiding an aching heart. We're going to hear about that tonight. So come along, bud. Let's take Lou to our chair of honor. <laughs> You'll never believe him again. We'll get her on as he takes his place in your life, Lou. Lou, let your mind go back now to your wonderful boyhood days. Uh, you were a member of, uh, what was the basketball team? What was it called? Oh, the Armory Five. Oh, the Armory Five? The Armory Five, yeah. You, you were with the Phil Sheridans for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you were the free throw. Patterson and the whole state of New Jersey, isn't that right? Uh. Well, look, uh, we want to see if you can still do it. Now, here's a regulation backstop uh, in basketball right here. Now, let's see if you can score a basket for the honor of the old Armory Five, the free throw champ of... This is, uh, here's hey. Jake, that's little Midgey Shields, and that's uh, Bill uh, Probert, and here's George Probert, and Jake Breslin, the whole gang. You're still all living in town. <laughs> Some team you had. There. What happened to the mascot? <laughs> Look, you're all still living in uh, Patterson, are you not, fellas? Yes, that's yeah. right. Why did you call your team the uh, Armory Five, Jake? Well, we lived in the neighborhood of the old Armory, Ralph Farrell. And uh, we used to, in order to practice basketball, old man Kelly, the janitor, made us clean up the floors and sweep around. <laughs> <laughs> right, Lou? Yeah. Uh, how did uh, Lou promote his... Well, you tell us some more about the... Uh... Well, we were all sports crazy, Ralph. Uh, every week, we kids figured out some way to get in to see the pro basketball games and the fights. Yeah. Right, buddy? Yeah. How, did you, how did they get in there? Bill? Well, uh, Lou fast talked the professional players and carried their bags. Uh, he hoped to be mistaken for the mascot and admitted free. <laughs> if that didn't work, he used to shinny up the rain pipe and sneak in the window. I the used to carry him in the back. <laughs> Used to shinny up a, a rain yeah. fire? Just like a uh, human fly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Midgey Shields, Jake Breslin, Bill, and George Probert. You'll be seeing Lou tonight at the Lou. party in his honor at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Oh, oh, you fellas been staying away. Oh, oh my goodness. Just like it used to be when you were kids, eh, Lou? Oh, yeah. well. All right, down the old familiar Patterson streets, Lou. Let's go to your house on 33rd Street. Remember back there? Mm -hmm. Come on, let's take a walk back here to 33rd Street and look sitting on the front porch. There's Mom. Yes, indeed, your beloved Mom, Mrs. Priscilla. Here she is. No wonder they here, too. <laughs> I couldn't find nobody home. <laughs> Lou says he couldn't find anybody home. We, we were told that he came home early tonight. Everybody was gone. Says, where is everybody? Yeah. What's going on around yeah. here? Uh, let's see, Cristillo is your real name, That's right. Lou. Uh, but you changed it to Costello. When was this? 
Oh, uh, when I was doing extra work in pictures. Yeah? There was a girl named Helene Costello, and I took her name. Yes, indeed, remember her. Here we are, swinging with Mom on the porch on a summer very, evening. Very no, Just like in. you when you were a boy. <laughs> Dad's here in spirit, too, Lou, I'm sure, though he died in 1947. And it was here on the front porch swing that used to tell Mom about a glorious dream. Uh, what was that dream, Miss Crystal? Little Ralph, Lou always wanted to be an actor. And he used to say to me, well, Mother, someday I'm going to take you to California, to Hollywood, and I'm going to buy you a little white house. And you know, Ralph, he did all that. His dream. He bought me my little house. And he became and a he star. And he became a star. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> After a whirl as a prize fighter in Patterson, New Jersey, under the name of Lou King, that's the name you fought under, you talk your parents into letting you go to Hollywood to try to make that movie dream of yours come true. But it didn't. Not right at first. When I first met Lou in Hollywood, you didn't even have a place to sleep. Now that's the voice of a buddy of those real tough days. Uh, he was uh, sort of in a position to see that they were tough days for you. He used to run a parking lot at MGM Studios and had a little gas station there. Now in business at Lake Tahoe Resort, here from Lake Tahoe, California, is Mr. Eddie Devine. Here's Eddie. <laughs> Mama, you'll be going. Uh, where did, uh, there during those early days, Eddie? Well, for a while. You slept in a car. That's right, in the auto park. It's exactly <laughs> where he slept. And, and, uh, and uh, then I understand that uh, he and Gene Coogan used to wash their laundry out on the wash rack at night, yeah. the automobile wash rack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Huh? How about your eating in those days? Were things were. Uh, it's kind of tough. Yeah. Real tough. Uh, we didn't do much eating, but uh, we got along all right. Bread and jam for a month, I understand. Uh -huh. Lou worked at a laboring job there. Some of the laboring jobs in the studio, didn't he, Eddie? Yes. And, uh... Of course, he got his he big got break. He got a big break he? at that time. Uh, a stunt man on, for Joan Crawford. Mm -hmm. And you worked uh, extra in Rosemary and a few That's other right. pictures. Yeah. Well, this wasn't exactly the dream of stardom you would told Mom about there. So, you start hitchhiking back home. And in St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, you landed a job, didn't you, Lou? You got the whole story, Yeah, huh? we got it right. <laughs> you heard there was a burlesque show that wanted, uh, what? Yeah, there was a burlesque show in St. Joe, Missouri. They wanted a Dutch comedian. Right. So I was never on the stage, but I told a fellow I was a Dutch comedian. <laughs> <laughs> burlesque, the training ground for so many great comedians, was just a way to make a living to you, Lou Costello, age 20 in 1928. Thank you, Eddie Devine of Lake Tahoe, California. And thank you, Mrs. Helen Cristillo. You take Mom back with the Armory Five, Eddie. Lou, you'll see her later. There you go. Burlesque, Lou, in uh, a most unusual way, is to bring you face to face with your wife. And we know that uh, you stood, uh, you've stood together since in the most difficult problems that face a father and mother. Now, we leave your story for a moment, and I know you would be happy to catch your breath just a minute. Yes, yes I would. Okay, fella. Bye, world-famous comedian, beloved by all of us, Lou Costello of Abbott and Costello. <laughs> Nineteen thirty-three, Lou. You're a pretty handsome guy there. You're a handsome guy now. You're the comedian at the Republic Burlesque Theater in New York City. In the chorus, is a pretty dark-haired girl named Ann Backler, whom you'd like to meet. I met her. <laughs> you sure did. They took a very impetuous young man, but I didn't expect he'd knock me out. Uh-huh. Lou, you're right, your wife, she helped us plan this. Go easy on her, it's been a <laughs> tough week. Here you are, Ann, Mrs. Lucas Nello. Come on, you there, Lou. Oh, if you know what this, if you knew what this gal had been going on, Mom and Eddie and the whole gang here. Now, uh, sit beside your husband, and and tell us how Lou's wooing knocked you out. <laughs> I think he's knocked out now, isn't he? <laughs> well, I wasn't particularly interested in me, yeah. but a girlfriend of mine in the show insisted I should go, 
and uh, see Lou do this act. Yeah. Which I did. And he makes a sudden turn on stage. Where were you standing? There. In the wings. Oh, my. And he hits his head on this hall tree, knocks it over, and knocks <laughs> me out cold. That was my introduction to Lou. <laughs> and now we got three children and two grandchildren. Oh. <laughs> well, he told the whole story. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Within four months, you two are married. And in your very first year of marriage, Lou, you and Ann had an automobile accident, didn't you? Yes, we did. What happened? You want to tell us about that? Well, it was uh, sort of early in the morning, around 3 in the morning, and uh, there was a bus coming around a turn, I think, in, uh, around Massachusetts, and, uh, and I wanted to get away from him, and I did, but I went over a, an embankment and landed amongst a lot of trees about 40 feet. Then you took a bus to Patterson. No, we hitchhiked all the way back. Ah, I'll change that little note in here. Uh, you walked uh, then from, uh, you got to the, your, your folks' home, isn't that oh, right? Oh, yes, yes. And when you got home, what did you find really at home? Well, we were very fortunate, Ralph. Uh, family physician, he came in and he said, well, this is not for me, but I'm going to call a doctor right away. And he did, a Dr. Redding, mm -hmm. who lived two blocks away from us on 33rd Street. And he was, at that time, supposed to be about surgeons in the whole country. And he put my wife immediately in a hospital and in a cab here. But the answer is she had a broken, a broken neck. A broken neck all this time. Mr. Cast, as you say, for over a year. Mm. Money problems on a burlesque comedian's salary are pretty grim for you. I like Lou's clean brand of comedy and believed we could make a hit of it if we got together. <laughs> the other half! Except the yeah. letters, <laughs> that we meet and talk it over. The other half of the celebrated comedy team. Here he is again, Bud Abbott, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Take it like I made you. Your face is very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> you two form your team in 1936, fellas. Yeah. Did success come easily then, bud? Uh, no, no, Ralph, but uh, our timing, our timing was perfect for each other, but it took, oh, at least three years of struggle to get our first act uh, organized and uh, material together. Right. And during that time, Lou, your baby girls, Patty Ann and Carol Lou, are born. You remember those days, Ann? I certainly do, Ralph. We lived in a basement apartment in Atlantic City, huh? and the floor was so small, this daughter kept falling out of the crib on her head every night. <laughs> she's throwing her back in. <laughs> then, say, Ann, she's out again. She's out again. Your turn. Your big break comes, and a chance on the Kate Smith radio show in 1938. <laughs> week after week, you and Bud keep the nation screaming with laughter, and this leads in 1940 to your first movie. Isn't that right, uh, Yes, that's right. Uh, in fact, Lou and I were both amazed at the uh, response that we got from our first couple of movies. That's right. Almost overnight, Abbott and become the number one box office attraction in the nation. And will any of us ever forget the laughs you two gave us in such all-time hits as Buck Privates, Rio Rita, In the Navy, and many, many more wonderful comedy pictures from the two And here, at the pinnacle of fame, Lou, you're struck down by rheumatic fever. You face a year in bed with a chance that you may never get well. Isn't that right, bud? Well, if I walked into Lou's sick room, he had tears in his eyes. And he was probing over a lot of, oh, hundreds and hundreds of letters from kitty fans who were in the same predicament as Lou, bedridden with rheumatic fever. And all the months that he was in bed, he was answering these letters. Their parents had written to Lou and asked him to beg his children, their, their children, not to get for that yes, type of... Yeah. Uh, and anyhow, Lou wrote and wrote and wrote and kept on writing, and that's all he did was write to those kiddies and told them to stay in bed and get well. Right, but I, I know your daily visits to Lou meant a lot when he was so ill. It meant everything. I only wish, I only wish it protected our friendship. But everyone knows that Lou and I had a rift in 1945. Like a lot of people do, we magnified a difference of opinion. And we let a molehill become a mountain. Lou, I thank God we came to our senses. I'm glad that neither you and I could sing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Today our friendship seems all the more precious to me because we almost lost it forever through foolish pride. Thank you, Bud Abbott. Believe me, that may make a lot of people see how to forgive them. You bet. Just before that first long illness 
of yours, Lou, another lifelong dream comes true. And here presents you with a baby boy, your little son. What's your pet name for him? What'd you call him? Little oh, Butch. Little oh, Butch. Butch was to be one year old on November 6, 1943. On November 4th, uh, what was the gala broadcast that you were scheduled to do? Well, we were doing a broadcast. Your... It was my first broadcast after my illness. That's right. To tell of the events of that day, here's your faithful friend and manager, Mr. Eddie Sherman. Here's Eddie. You know, Ralph, Lou was planning to use some funny sounds on the show that night so little Butch could hear him at home how much Butch loved him. And his wife, Mrs. Costello, may be awake at night to hear the show. But you know, Ralph, that afternoon at the studio, I got the tragic call from Lou's home that his little baby had drowned in the family pool. Uh, how did it happen? Well, Mrs. Costello had gone out shopping. The nurse had put little Butch in the playpen, but somehow he worked one of the slats loose and climbed out by the pool and dropped in unnoticed. You drive Lou home, and after he does all he can to console Mrs. Costello, uh, what does Lou tell you, Eddie? Well, Lou was terribly heartbroken. This was a great tragedy to him. He thought the whole world tumbled from under him. But he said to me, Eddie, I want to go back to the studio and do the show. Promised little Butch that he would hear me tonight. And wherever God has taken him, I know he will hear me. And I want to keep my promise. As great an example of love could ever display. Thank you, Eddie Sherman. The heart that came near breaking, Lou, you've gone on to make the world laugh. The more you've suffered, the more you wanted to bring healing to others. They called me Goldilocks when I sold my long hair to buy war stamps. Mr. Costello saved my life. Remember that girl, Lou? Yeah, Goldilocks. It, it's been ten years since you've seen her. We found her in Canada, uh, where today she's wife to a young student minister. Here from Three Hills, Alberta, Canada, is Mrs. Milton Palmer, Lisa, whom you knew as Goldilocks Wolf. As a girl of uh, 14, you sold your long hair for use in wartime precision instruments. Why was that, Ms. Palmer? To buy war stamps and to try to inspire other children to buy them. And then later, I had my appendix out and complications set in that caused me to waste away to 60 pounds. They said I would die. How did you hear of her, Lou? Do you recall? I was laying in bed and I read the newspaper about it. I see. What did Lucas Costello do for you, Ms. Palmer? Well, they flew me to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and there Mr. Costello spent thousands of dollars for my operations and care. Then my mother wired to him saying, uh, Lisa Lota will live. God bless you. I thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for saving my life. Thank you, Thank you. Lou, here's one more example of the many people you've helped. Remember the boy who spent 11 years unable to walk, paralyzed in a hospital in Patterson, New Jersey? Yeah. Look, Miss Costello, I'll walk. Here he is, your grateful young friend, Frank Morbito, walking toward you. Here he comes, oh. buddy! <laughs> <laughs> what did Mr. Costello do when he heard of, of you, Frank? Well, he sent me to New York Hospital. And uh, <laughs> get over yeah, there. that's all right. <laughs> he gave uh, and he get a big surgical form and a spine operation. Yeah, and make me walk again. God bless you, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> and today, today, Frank here. Yeah, Lou, you'll be happy to know. You maybe you know a uh, technician at St. Joseph's in Patterson, the very hospital where you used to lay paralyzed, <laughs> Frank. Thank you, Frank Morbita, and thank you, Mrs. Milton Palmer. Thank you. As a memorial to your infant son, in 1942, or I guess it was 47, wasn't it? Yes, you and your partner, Bud Abbott, build and equip the fabulous Lou Costello Jr. Recreation Center for Los Angeles teeming East Side youth. There in the gym, the pool, the playground, boys like these are building good citizenship. And in memory of little Butch, many hundreds of boys and girls have had their lives protected by learning to swim. 
uh, as close to your heart as those children see who are even closer. Your three daughters. First here is Patricia Ann, Pat, Mrs. James Mopley, with her husband, Jim, and your two grandchildren, Lou and Michael. There you are. This is Jim, the husband. Lou and Michael, and daughter Carol, Lou Costello, home from Oklahoma University. And little Christy. Here's Christy. That's uh, Carol Lou from Oklahoma, you. And this is Christy, your youngest. Sit there, will you? Come on, Mom, you join the gang up here, Mrs. Christello. This is your life, Lou Costello. The past that brought you tragedy and sorrow caused you to open the door to the future for others. So you're among those fortunate ones who have made their lives an inspiration. Now, now Lou, uh, let's take a look into your uh, future. Uh, know that part of your future will be at the Sahara Las Vegas, where you and Bud will open December 1st. And I know all... Fourth? Fourth? Oh, I'm sorry. I know that... Uh... <laughs> I was manager. You were chairman. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, we, I know all the folks will... Come along, see you who are around that way. First of all, Crest would like to present you, Mrs. Costello, and with this beautiful custom design gold charm bracelet from Marshall Jewelers in New York City. Uh, there you go. Each charm represents an important event. Crest will also see to it that you and Lou receive a complete film of tonight's program. Now, Lou, also, these are for you from Marshall there. Compliments Thank of Crest. You. Now, Lou, we know that as one of the founders and staunchest supporters of the Old Timers Club in Patterson, New Jersey, you are particularly proud of its success and achievements in helping the youngsters of Patterson become uh, better citizens. So in your name, we're sending them this Bell & Howell 16-millimeter sound projector and camera to be used as a visual aid in combating both the seeds and delinquency. Thank you. Now, also, Lou, in your name, Crest has established and endowed 10 scholarships at the famous DeVry Technical Institute in Chicago, one of America's foremost electronic centers, an institution which for the past 25 years has been training men for better jobs in electronics. For the next 10 years, one scholarship will be awarded each year by the Old Timers Club to the boy in the Patterson, New Jersey area who uh, shows the most interest and aptitude in this field. The boy will need no previous technical experience or advanced education. What's more, after each uh, boy uh, completes his schooling, DeVry Tech's Employment Service will help him find a job or start him uh, in his own business, thanks to you. Thank Finally, you. one of our informants just happened to hear you make this statement last Friday morning as you were getting ready to go to work. Now listen. He said, one of these days I'm going to buy me a wristwatch that works. Did you say that, Lou, huh? <laughs> well, here comes, here comes a delegation uh, <laughs> to uh, prove that out. Seven of the more than 10,000 members of the Lou Costello Jr. Recreation Center. Here they come, right here. The whole gang. And I understand you boys and girls have something you'd like to uh, say to uh, Mr. Costello. Is, is that right? That's right, Mr. Edwards. Oh, good. What, what is it, Joseph? Well, you sure helped an awful lot of us kids, Mr. Costello, and we just want to thank you. Here, we all chipped in and bought you this for you. You're wonderful. Yeah, and, and, and what about... And read what it says on the back. Yes, yeah, see what it says on the back. <laughs> it says, thanks for sharing your life with ours. Oh, thank you ever so much. This... This is your life, Lou Costello. America and all the world is because of the laughter you've brought into our lives. But even more important, you've shared the rewards of that laughter with the needs of a child. Good night, Lou. Ralph, thanks a lot. Thanks to you, pal, and thanks to all these wonderful people who've come from out of your past to be with you tonight. Yeah. Here we go. Say hello to him, gang. <laughs> this is your life is a Ralph Edwards production. Produced by Axel Gruenberg and directed by Richard G